Hello, uh, welcome to the second week of Office Hours. Uh, we have both been following, Christina Starmans and I have both been following the discussion boards, and the discussion is vibrant and very interesting with some excellent questions. So without further ado, let's just jump in. All right, so a great list of questions this week. Um, the first one is a sort of general question about the topic of the course, morality. Um, the question is from Victor Filho. Um, and Victor says, well, morality is about how we interact with other people, sometimes large groups of other people. Um, doesn't that fall into the domain of sociology instead of psychology? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, yes, it, it also falls into the domain of sociology. It falls, the, the study of morality crosses many interdisciplinary domains. Sociology, history, political science, law, theology, course philosophy evolutionary theory, just about every domain having to do with, the, with um, humans and covers morality in one way or another. The reason why I as a psychologist study morality from a psychological perspective is I'm interested in uh, <clears throat> the brain mechanisms, the cognitive mechanisms, the psychological mechanisms that go into understanding morality and go into our, our moral actions and our moral judgments. Now. Part of what I'm interested in is how we're influenced by other people. Morality, as he points out, is a very social thing. But I don't study it by looking at just at the level of society. I study it more from the standpoint of how individual people think about it. Okay. All right, next question is a pop culture question for you from Jonathan Koblick. So there's a recent movie, Gone Girl, based on a book, um, and he wants to know, is it possible for this character in Gone Girl to exist, and if so, would she be someone who'd be considered a perfect psychopath? So I happen to have just seen the movie, Gone Girl, and I, I had read the book. Have you seen the movie? I have not. Have you read the book? Not yet. Should I be reading the book? No. <laughs> you should see the movie. Okay. Because having read the book, um, then you know what's going to everything. The movie is very faithful to the book. And so the movie was a lot of fun. But it would have been more surprising to have seen it, seen it without uh, having read the book. So for those of you who haven't uh, read the book or seen the movie... Uh, no spoilers. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so given that I can't do spoilers, I'm not going to answer the question. I'll answer more generally, which is movies depict real bad people. They depict uh, psychopaths and monsters and sadists and so on. And one question that continually arises is the extent to which these are realistic depictions of evil. And for the most part, they are not. For the most part, they are, are fantasy. Um, we might have talked about this in class or in previous office hours, but Roy Baumeister talks about the myth of pure evil, which depicts itself in movies and, and novels and all sorts of fictional events, which is about the sort of monster who wants, wants evil for its own sake. The sort of Heath Ledger character, the, the Joker in Christopher Nolan's Batman, you know, just wants the world to burn. Mm -hmm. And the probably it's a big world out there. And it wouldn't surprise me there are some individuals that are, want evil for, for its own sake. But most people who do bad things, who do things the rest of the world view as bad, don't themselves see themselves as evil people. Rather, they see themselves as good people who have to do bad things. Or they see the things that other people describe as evil as good, or at best as neutral. The villain who is sort of self-consciously villainous is much more common in fiction than in reality. Similarly to the evil laugh, much more common in fiction than reality. I've never met somebody who had an <laughs> evil cackle. Um, you know, now, now, what's interesting is people often laugh when they're doing bad things, but often it's just nerves. It's just, it's just people laugh when, when they're nervous. There's, there's, the Mil there's the Stanley Milgram video, we'll discuss this later on in the course, but Stanley Milgram did a famous experiment here at Yale where he got people into a lab and had them kill strangers. He I mean, didn't really have them kill strangers, but had them believe they were killing strangers by increasing electrical shocks to them. And if you watch the video, what strikes me as interesting is the people doing the shocks, killing these people, are cracking up, they're laughing. But it's not an evil, maniacal laugh. It's, it's this nervous, anxious laugh. Um, 
And so, yeah, so a lot of, if, if you, if when you think of evil, you think of the Satan in, uh, in uh, Paradise Lost, or you think of Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, or the character in Gone Girl, you get the wrong view of what evil is. I think there's a, a parallel with uh, good characters in movies, the heroes, they're, are they too good, they're unrealistic in the same way as, as the two evil characters? That's a good question. Um, so certainly in, in sort of characters for children and, and a lot of, of old-timey movies, you'd have the pure good character, uh, the Superman hero, the, her the hero who's definitely a good person. More and more, I think, and this is one of the reasons why modern television is the great art form of our time, perhaps any time, is that you have increasingly sophisticated good guys. And the bad guys are often still simple-minded and, and evil, but the good guys get complicated, where they often have conflicting desires. You have a, a, a cop who takes bribes, but is otherwise a good guy. Maybe he's, he suffers from addiction, he's violent, but he's otherwise a good guy. And, um, and there are cases where in the best fiction, um, TV shows like uh, The Wire or Breaking Bad, evil and good shade into one another which is, I think, a depiction of what happens in real life. Yeah. Okay, so back to the, the monster side, <laughs> the bad people. Um, there's a question from Mikhail Namov, um, who is asking about terrorism. Um, and so uh, he's asking whether you think that terrorists in general are often psychopaths, and if not, um, how do they manage to sort of suppress having empathy for their victims and so on? Yeah. Um. It wouldn't surprise me if terrorist groups tend to pick up uh, people who like violence and who like hurting people for uh, its own sake. I think military forces do, police forces do, they'll pick up the minority of people who really want to have a gun and kill people or threaten people or have power. But for the most part, um, I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about before, which is terrorists don't see themselves as terrorists. So. I gave a talk about a week ago uh, on another aspect of my work on pleasure. And somebody from the audience asked me, uh, so what do you think of the pleasure that the people from ISIS get when they behead people? And my answer, occurred, my answer is to throw a question back. What sort of pleasure do you think Barack Obama gets when he has drones kill innocent people as collateral? And then the answer, this is an American audience, and, and, and sort of a liberal American audience, is, well, he doesn't feel any pleasure for that. He's not a sadist. Why would you think he'd get pleasure from that? Well, why would you think ISIS gets pleasure? Basically, in both sides, you have people who are doing what they feel is the right thing and doing terrible acts in the course of it, but th that they feel are justified. Now, I'm not a moral relativist. I'm critical of the drone attacks, but I think that you know beheading innocent people is a mon just you know it, to terrorize other people is a, is monstrous behavior. But the people doing it don't see it as monstrous behavior. They're not evil villains cackling as they do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, segueing to another evil villain we discussed last week, uh, um, you know the opportunity to go back in time and kill baby Hitler. Um, there's a question following up on that from Evan, Evan Evans, um, who, who wants to know, well, okay, so let's say you did have the opportunity to go kill Hitler, or potentially prevent World War II and so on. Um, how do we know really what the consequences of that action are going to be? So who's to say that, um, that killing Hitler doesn't result in some sort of greater catastrophe later on? You can't sort of foresee all of the big consequences of every small action. So how are we supposed to act in a utilitarian yeah. way? So utilitarians tell us, act so as to increase the sort of amount of pleasure or happiness in the world and a decreased amount of pain and suffering in the world. That's how you should act. And, and, but, but in some way that's sort of like saying, you know, buy low, sell high. That describes the goal you want to get, but how are you supposed to do it? Mm -hmm. and it is a hard problem because it involves making predictions about the future. There's a famous line from Yogi Berra, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you could go wrong. You could save the drowning girl who then blows up the world. Mm -hmm. you, you, could, you could end up um, 
uh, you know, assaulting somebody, and as a result of assaulting a the person, they become this, you know, this great civil rights leader and transform the world for the better. And you can imagine being paralyzed in a state of sort of nihilism, where you say, ah, you know, there's, it's not that there's no right and wrong, so it's not real nihilism, it's this, this hopelessness that you can't know what your actions will do, what, what effects that they will have. But I think that's too extreme. For the most part, we do know. For the most part, if I, um, if I want to have, um, if I want to make a nice dinner tonight, I have to drive to the grocery store and pick up my food and bring it home. Now, I could get killed in an accident driving there. Maybe if I stay home, maybe all of a sudden some friends will, will surprise me and bring over food to my house. You can't know. But still, for the most part, you know, if I want to if, if I want to be dressed today, I better put on some pants. Do I know that putting on the pants is going to help? Maybe it'll blow away in a storm. Maybe I'll come here without pants, but someone will give me pants. But typically, <laughs> you can predict the local effects of actions. Typically, if you if somebody if your child is crying, you pick up the child, you reassure the child. It's a good thing. It's a good effect. Typically, stealing from somebody has a bad effect. And so. In the world we live in, put aside going back in time and assassinating Hitler, in the world we live in, often we can tell the texture of our acts. Now, in the broader world, and it comes to policy, thousands, millions of people, it becomes complicated. Was the killing of Osama bin Laden a good thing or not? Well, it's hard to tell. Um, in the course of killing him, uh, Americans uh, had to set up a fake immunization procedure so as to get information about people, so they pretended. As a result of that, uh, many places in Pakistan distrust real immunization procedures, assuming that this is yet another American plot. So actions have consequences in ways you wouldn't anticipate. And one conservative response to enthusiastic, liberal, or progressive plans is to worry about unintended consequences. And, and, and I have some sympathy for that. But in the local world we live in, you could usually have, have a pretty good bet tell the effects of your actions. Okay. All right. So next question is from Stephen Nicholas. Um, and we've talked a bunch about um, sort of the ways that empathy makes us um, you know, focus more on people who are close by, who we can see right in front of us, who are identifiable, and less on, you know, people who are far away in other countries who are suffering. Um, and Stephen is asking, what should be our relationship between people who are close to us and people who are far away? Is there any argument that we owe more um, sort of uh, charity and so on to those who are closer to us? Or should we see them as completely equal? It's an it's a good question, and it could be taken one of two ways. One way is, is there anything inherently moral, sorry, is there anything in inherently relevant about the difference between near and far from a moral perspective? And it seems crazy to think that there would be. I can't imagine a moral theory that would say there would be, that, that there's a world of difference between you stabbing me with a knife now is reaching over and killing me, versus going across the room and throwing a knife that kills me, versus being in Australia and pressing a button that a knife comes and kills me. It's not that these actions become progressively less wrong the further away you are from me. Conversely, if it matter of you saving my life, it seems strange to have that you have a big obligation to save my life when you're right next to me versus a few steps away versus in Australia. What, what difference could it make? So that's sort of answer one. But at the same time, the near-far does have real-world relevance, I think because it correlates with certain things. And one thing that it correlates with is the special obligation that, you, that one could have by being the only person there to help. So typically in cases of, of proximity, I'm drowning in front of you, and you could reach out your hand to save me. One of the things, it's not being near in and of itself, that matters is that you're typically the only one who could help. Well, if you were 100 miles away, you aren't the only one who could help. Now, one could argue about how much of a difference that should make, but that does seem like a relevant moral consideration. I have more of an obligation to act when no one else could act. 
Well, just to push back a little bit on the, the idea that maybe we have more responsibility to help those who are local to us or something. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would agree we have more responsibility, for example, to help our family members, our friends, than we do to help strangers. Um, is there some sense in which I have a similar sort of more responsibility to help, for example, a homeless person in New Haven than a homeless person in Europe somewhere? I don't know. There, there's the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and the Good Samaritan is walking around. He sees that you have before him the priest and the Levite. They, it's, it's a story from the Gospels. They walk, they see somebody, they see somebody who's struggling, who's unconscious, and they just keep walking. And the Good Samaritan stops and, and saves him. But, but Jeremy Waldron, and we'll discuss this, I think, in a later lecture, points out that, that the moral of the Good Samaritan story isn't go help everybody. The story emphasizes the proximity, that your eyes fall upon a person and, and you see them. Um, now, to some extent, it just falls back on what I'm saying before, which is if you're close enough to see somebody in trouble, that might mean you're uniquely situated to help. You're raising another issue, which is that there are certain ties that matter, uh, the ties of family, the ties of love, of friendship, and maybe the ties of neighborliness. Now, neighborliness is actually different from mere physical proximity, because um, if I'm on vacation in Australia, and somebody from New Haven needs help, I might have a special obligation to help them because I live in New Haven. I'm just visiting Australia. And there, my own feeling is it shouldn't help. My own feeling is that to, to feel a connection with somebody just because they happen to live close to you, be your neighbor, is no different in kind than feeling a connection because the color of their skin is the same as yours. I think differently about kinship and friendship. And in that way, maybe when it comes to kinship and friendship, I'm not a utilitarian. I, I think that we do have special bonds and special obligations to those we love, to our parents, to our children, and so on. And so I'm not denying all distinctions, but I think a near far distinction in and of itself isn't really that tenable. Okay. All right, so next we have a number of questions all relating to the idea of empathy and its effects on our moral behavior. Um, and just to, to start that off, there's this really nice long thread, a lot of people contributing to it, and the subject line of the thread is, I'm confused. Uh, and Evan Evans has started this, this thread off as well. Um, and, and just to sort of summarize his post, he says, I'm confused. You seem to be against empathy. That can't be right, can it? Yeah. So. Evan Evans probably got the idea that I'm against empathy because I wrote an article called Against Empathy. Could um, be. <laughs> and, and, you know, so people had the craziest interpretations. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I followed that thread with a lot of interest. And one thing going on here is just this is a bit of background, which is when I present the lectures, I have, of course, all sorts of idiosyncratic views on things. But when I present the lectures, I try as best I can and nobody's perfect at this, to present a field of moral psychology as most people see it. And here's the data, here are the arguments. Sometimes I sort of take sides, but for the most part I try to say, there's this argument, there's that argument. I begin by presenting Jonathan Haidt and Sam Harris, who have very different views. And, uh, so, and I talk about empathy in that light. And most people believe empathy plays a very important role in morality. And I, and I describe how that would work, and I, I make the case for it from their point of view. In my life as a scholar, as an academic, as a writer, I often present things and arguments that go in very different directions and that are, are unconventional. I, I, you know, I, obviously, they're sort of, if I said what everybody else said, it wouldn't be very interesting. And one of the things I'm saying is I argue against empathy. Now, what do I mean arguing against empathy? So there's two things I would just say at the outset. One thing is by empathy, I mean something specific. So. I don't mean, I mean to distinguish empathy from kindness and love and being a good person and caring about other people and wanting to make the world a better place. I'm in favor of all of those things. I want to distinguish empathy from understanding other people's minds. Because I think that's important too. How could you be a good person if you didn't know what's going on in somebody's head? By empathy, what I mean is by what some people call emotional empathy, which is feeling other people's pain, feeling their suffering also feeling their happiness. 
That, I think, is a poor moral guide. I should also add that when I'm against empathy, I'm only against empathy as a moral guide. I think empathy is wonderful for, um, for uh, uh, movies and books, for sex, for sports, for all sorts of things. There's all sorts of things which is very enjoyable to see the world as another person sees it, to feel what they're feeling. I just think it's a lousy way to live a moral life. Okay. All right, so there were a number of really interesting objections to this yeah. view that people raised. So I'm going to go through a few of them. The first one is from Victor Knight. Um, and uh, he's arguing that you can't get to compassion and kindness and love and so on without empathy. Empathy is sort of the, the method, the, the spark that we need for, for getting to those other things that you, that you do think are, are good things. So it's a perfectly sensible view. You can see it happening. You see. Um, you can see, for instance, somebody is suffering, and, and then what you do is you take their perspective. You say, I wonder what it's like to be them. I wonder what it's like to be you know, a gay kid who's bullied. I wonder what it's like to have my house burned down, uh, uh, to be discriminated against, whatever. Experiences that you're not having, but through the power of empathy, you feel them in a bit. You, you, you experience them. And that, it's pretty clear, can motivate you to care to help to do something. So that's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. All I'll point out is that doesn't have to be the way it works. So it's actually not hard to find examples of compassion or good actions that don't involve any empathy at all. I'm walking down the road and I see a little girl drowning. So she's in the water, she's, she's like drowning, her head's bobbing up and down, and then everything. And then what do I do? Well, being a good person, um, I reach in and I pull her out. That's kind action, it's compassionate, and so on. Did I have to empathize with her? Did I think, I wonder what it feels like to be drowning? No. Nobody who ever does something that tries to experience what it's like to be drowning. I know drowning is bad. I don't need to empathize with it. Um, or take charities. So it's possible that you read about starving kids in Africa, and you say, oh my gosh, and you imagine, I wonder what it feels like to be starving. They're like, have your tummy empty and everything. Oh, it's really bad. I better send them some money. But that's not typically what happens. Again, you know starving's bad. You might have a moral code. You might have a religious code. You might do it out of habit, out of custom, and then you, and then you, you might help. And so feeling other people's pain, I could imagine cases where it would motivate good action, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be the trigger for good action. So uh, I could imagine Victor or someone taking this position, arguing that if you just know that drowning is bad, or you know that being hungry is bad, that sort of doesn't get you to caring that drowning is bad, right? Um, so don't we need empathy to motivate us to fix the bad problem, right? So you can just note that it's bad that the girl is drowning and move on if you didn't have some sort of emotional response to it. It's true, and this is a point made in different ways by philosophers like David Hume. And they point out correctly that pure reason, pure logic, doesn't get you to do anything. You see a girl drowning, you say, drowning is bad, she'll die, her family will mourn, I could help. Okay, and you keep walking. You need the extra push, the extra spark to get you to do something. But the spark doesn't have to be empathy. There's all sorts of things that could spark you. Um, you could be sparked by compassion, which is a feeling for, oh, her life is value, I want her to live. I'm not going to get put myself in her shoes, but I want her to live. You could be sparked by a sense of justice, by a belief in God, by custom, even by anticipated shame or guilt if you didn't act. There's all sorts of things that could provide you the kick in the pants that you need for action. And in fact, empathy might be an ill-suited one. Because for instance, one of the problems with empathy is that if I'm watching you suffer and I'm now experiencing your suffering, that may be paralyzing. It might be upsetting, actually. And I can make this go away. I can make it go away by turning away from you. And I think many people say, who they see somebody suffering on the streets, like a homeless person, 
Many people who are highly empathetic will walk by, experience their suffering, and then walk faster because that's the way to make their own pain go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a perfect lead into our next question, actually, um, which is from Kristen Brandt. Um, and Kristen actually is one of the, the maybe few people on the threads who are arguing uh, against empathy with you. Um, so she, but this is sort of a question. Is maybe one of the reasons that empathy is bad is that if you're acting out of empathy, so if I'm saving the drowning girl because I'm imagining what it's like to be drowning and I'm, I'm sort of suffering in imagining that, then my action is sort of in order to reduce my own suffering um, because I'm feeling what the person is feeling. And so does that make empathy a, a, a particularly selfish sort of motivation? So thank you for supporting my view <laughs> for being one of the few. Um, yeah, empathy, empathetic helping could often be selfish because you, you can apply it to make your own pain go away, your own empathetically uh, induced pain go away. Now, somebody could say, well, who cares if it's selfish? It still could drive you to do good things. But I think one of the problems with empathy is that it is very myopic. It focuses you on the short term, on what's in front of you. So suppose there's a situation where you're suffering, but it turns out that, and I can make your suffering go away, but it turns out your suffering is for a greater good. I mean, we don't have to have science fiction cases for this. Um, my toddler runs out into the street into traffic. I, I pull her back, I yell at her, I say, never ever do that again. She starts crying. And maybe the right thing to do is to let her cry a bit, let her remember this, let her feel awful about it so she never runs out into traffic again. But someone who's too empathetic will say, I, I can't take this, I can't take the suffering. And then we'll pick up and embrace the toddler. Imagine as, a, as a, a, the world's worst TV series, The Empathetic Policeman. So the empathetic policeman, he stops crimes. But if the criminal he stops, like some guy robbing a bank, starts to cry and says, don't send me back to prison, I would hate going back to prison, the policeman feels the empathy. And then says, fine, I'll let you go. Well, that's a pretty bad policeman. It, it's, it's a bad policeman because he's letting his empathy override broader considerations of morality and fairness. And I think empathy does that for all of us. Okay, so um, next question is from Christopher Koval, um, and uh, he wants to get your take on other emotions like shame or guilt that might play into our moral behavior or moral judgments. Um, these uh, emotions like shame, embarrassment, guilt, they seem sort of just as emotionally salient, just as potentially problematic as empathy. Do you think empathy is special or should we sort of be worried about all of these kinds of emotions? I think we should worry about all emotions. I think that, that these emotions have different status and different value. Like I said before, we need some sort of motivation to motivate our behavior. Um, and I wouldn't say that any of these emotions is wholly bad. Some are worse than others. Um, disgust which we've talked about already, seems to be a particularly corrosive emotion from a moral point of view. It causes you to degrade people to think of them as less. Um, anger, anger almost paradoxically I think is a more morally reliable emotion than empathy because we could be angry at injustice. Anger is often a great prod uh, to change the world. But of course anger can go to extremes if you, as if when you beat somebody to death because you're, you're angry at them. And shame and guilt are complicated. So we could be ashamed of ourselves or guilty about actions that um, are just irrational. Uh, people being ashamed of their sexuality, for instance, even though no one's harmed by it. But sometimes we feel guilty about things we really should feel guilty about. And then it's a useful motivating force because it makes you less likely to do it again. And so. I think that for each of the emotions we should look at them kind of cold-bloodedly and ask what they're for and whether we are happy with the way they shape our moral lives. Okay. All right. Um, next question. It's, it's not exactly a question. The, the subject of this thread, which a lot of people chimed in on, is uh, confessions of a very empathetic person. Um, and there are a lot of stories of the, the ways in which um, you know, the students in the class are sort of um, confessing their, their uh, extreme levels of empathy. And some of them are sort of wondering, you know, so I'm convinced by your arguments that empathy is bad in certain ways, 
but I'm a very naturally empathetic person, um, what should I do about it? Should, are there like, like anger management classes? Are there empathy management classes I can take? <laughs> it's a good thought. Um, you know, there's all these things on reducing your anger and everything. And uh, you imagine going into business, having like one of those Kickstarter things where we set up a business and <laughs> how to have less empathy, make your kids less empathetic, less empathetic workplace. And then we collect over years, no money at all, because <laughs> people would think that we're deranged. Um, so, so it's a very odd question, but I think it's a good question because I do think too much empathy can mess you up. And I know this from experience. So, you know, I'm writing a book called Against Empathy. And so people, you know, people contact me and they say, you must be some sort of monster. What has empathy ever done to you? And, you know, somebody must have betrayed you when you were young. But actually, it, the book has a bit of a personal motivation, but it's, it's the opposite, which I see myself as too vulnerable to empathy. I look at a lot of the bad things I've done in my life, the mistakes I've made, and sometimes it's because I let myself get too caught up in people's immediate mm -hmm. feelings. Um, so what do you do about it? Well, I think uh, part of the answer is the same way you would treat any other psychological trait that you're not happy with. So it's, suppose these people weren't saying, I'm too empathetic. Suppose they were saying, I'm too racist. I think racism is wrong. I've been convinced racism is wrong. I can't help it. I just don't like people of that skin color. I feel much more comfortable with people of this skin color. I tense up when I see somebody of that skin color. I relax for the other. So, so what, do you, what do you do in such cases? I don't think the answer is just try to be less racist. I think the answers are complicated, but one way to do it is try to construct your life so that your better self shines through. So, um, so, so if, you're, if, you're, if you realize you have racist biases and you're in a position where you have power over people, try to work it so that you're making decisions without knowing what, you're, what these people look like. Try to, if you feel or be biased, try to defer a decision to somebody who doesn't suffer from your problem. And to some extent, this is the way it is with empathy. I think if you're, if you're, if you're highly empathetic, you should try to make your decision, try to avoid things that would trigger your empathetic reactions. Um, I'll take a very mundane example. I don't mean this to be a morally significant example, but it's an everyday life thing for me, which is that sometimes students come and they complain about their grades. Now, like anybody who does grades, I will make mistakes in grades. I will grade two people, people too harshly or too leniently. But they don't come to complain that I gave them too high a grade. <laughs> They'll typically complain I gave them a lower grade than they believe that they have. Now, with my problem of empathy, if I was to let them talk with me, and they're saying, oh, you gave me a low grade, I'm so sad, I could, now I can't get into, into law school, I want to lose my scholarship, I'll be sent back to my country and enlisted in the army where I will surely die, and they're crying, and, then say, and my father will beat me to death if I'm not killed by, in this army thing that I made up, and they're sad, and I feel, oh my gosh, oh, I'll give you an A+. Plus. And here, have $200. And that's my inclination. I find it very hard to fight my inclination. But what I'll do is I'll tell the student, I don't want to see you. Send me a written explanation of where I got it wrong, and I will look that over, and I'll make my choice that way. And I think that that's more fair. Sometimes I do make mistakes, and sometimes I should correct them. But, but because of my vulnerability, I try to work as sort of empathetic appeals are something I could avoid in everyday life. Okay. Um, so some more empathy objections, um, and these are sort of pulled out of various Got threads. Um, so one, uh, one objection that comes up a lot is that your sort of position against empathy is just very easily refuted by looking at the fact that more empathetic people are the people who are typically kinder and more caring. We sort of see examples of this every day with the people we interact with. So many people believe that, and I think, I think that's typically rooted in a failure to distinguish empathy from other things like intelligence and compassion and interest in other people. So a lot of this issue was discussed in my Boston Review article which was assigned which is common sense tells you that if you were to rank people on how empathetic they are on a scale the more empathetic people would be kinder, more likely to help, less aggressive and so on. Turns out it's not true. It's just not true. 
people who are l very low in empathy are often just as nice as people high in empathy. There's not much of a relationship between your empathy and what kind of person you are. But weren't all the great moral leaders like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. and so on, weren't they driven by empathetic concerns? Um, so, as best we know, not particularly. These, these, in, in, from the biographies, and you know, the, the biographies of, of people who are um, moral heroes to many, uh, like Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi, Gloria Steinem, Ronald Reagan, Jesus, whatever. I mean, choose, choose your moral hero. The theme typically is not somebody who is empathetically alive. It's actually somebody who's pretty tough. And often the theme you get from, from these people isn't this empathetic resonance, but rather is anger. Anger at injustice, frustration at things going wrong. And uh, mixed with a pretty thick skin with the suffering of others. For instance, someone who is, who is high empathy is going to be bad at conflict. Because my conflict with you will involve, if I'm successful, you're suffering. And if I'm empathetic, that becomes aversive. But the great moral heroes don't shy away from a fight. And they fight to win. And even though they understand their winning will often involve you know, devastation and sadness to their enemies. I think, um, I, I think the psychology of somebody who changes the world, for better or worse, is somebody who is medium to low in empathy, but often high in other moral emotions. Okay, um, but another uh, sort of related objection is that uh, they can't really be lacking empathy. They can't be so low in empathy. People who lack empathy are psychopaths. Psychopaths are some of the worst people in the world. They do terrible things. So um, should we be putting the world in the hands of people who are uh, low empathy or psychopathic? So psychopaths do lack empathy, and psychopaths are bad people by definition. But other individuals who lack empathy are not bad people. Individuals with autism, for instance, lack empathy. By most tests, they're far less empathetic than psychopaths. But they're not bad people. They don't make the world worse. They're often the victims of, of cruelty, but very rarely the perpetrators of it. And what that suggests is that um, lack of empathy per se doesn't make you into a bad person. Also, uh, also keep in mind that, that the lack of empathy you see in psychopaths and in aggressive people is often a situational thing. In other words, it's not that their brains are low empathy and then they do bad things. Rather, they do bad things for all sorts of reasons. Low impulse control, often malevolent desires and so on. And then in the course of doing bad things, they turn down their empathy. So the psychologist Simon Baron Cohen points out, I think very reasonably, that, that almost by definition, people who murder each other or commit rapes or assaults are low empathy while they're doing it. And that doesn't mean they're low empathy people. But to some extent, the, act, the, the being violent requires diminishing your empathetic responses. OK. <clears throat> but to take a different approach, maybe we shouldn't be trying to dial down empathy or giving up on empathy. Maybe we should just be trying to extend it in a more fair and consistent and broader way. So instead of you know, giving up on empathy because it yeah. makes us focus on those close to us, just extend that empathy to you know, all of the people um, who are far, near and far. So there has to be a grain of truth to that. I mean, empathy could be used for good. We can often, we, we gave examples before about how being empathetic to somebody can motivate you to help them. And often a lot of moral appeals rely on empathy and, and rely on getting somebody to extend their empathy to the right place. But having said that, I think there are ways in which empathy is intrinsically incapable of driving us to the right moral decision. For one thing, empathy is innumerate. So a lot of the way morality has to work is you have to acknowledge that 100 lives are worth more than one. But empathy doesn't do that. 
Empathy can't distinguish between a hundred lives or a thousand lives or a million lives because you can't feel empathetic towards a million people or a hundred people or a thousand people. And so to the extent that that moral reasoning relies on that sort of moral calculations, empathy won't work. Another way empathy fails is that it draws our attention to the here and now at the expense of future possibilities. It's because of empathy that governments and individuals care a lot more about a little girl drowning in a well than they do about millions of people dying in an environmental catastrophe in the future. Because the girl is right there. The millions of people are statistical facts. And so empathy is silent about them. But as moral people, we shouldn't be silent about them. And that requires, actually, it requires not just using capacities other than empathy, but overriding our empathy. Empathy says, put all your resources into helping that girl. Well, sometimes morality says, ignore her. We've got bigger fish to fry. So others have suggested that maybe there's a way to, to use our capacity for empathy, but sort of tweak it to, uh, to change sort of the way it works, right? So that it could extend to larger groups of people and so on. And that it would, you know, if I could actually feel empathy for the hundred people and the one person, I would feel more empathy for the hundred people. And so I could sort of still use empathy to make those kinds of calculations. Do you think that's wrong? I think if, if you were a god or an angel, you could do that. I just think that that's beyond human capacity. Empathy, in the way we're talking about it, involves feeling someone at what someone else feels. You could do that with one person. Maybe you could do that with two. Can you do that with a hundred people? Suppose we're deciding a policy that will affect China. Can you feel empathy for the population of China? No. In some way, to make that response, which I've heard many times, is like I'm saying, you know, people are really bad at multiplying 200 digit numbers together. We should use calculators. And the person says, no, we just got to work on our mental math a bit, get better and better at it. Well, there's a certain point where we, we can't get better and better at it. And, and, and with empathy, that point, we should point very quickly when it comes to people. Okay. Um, next subjection is, well, if we don't use empathy, we're, you're sort of suggesting we replace it with reason. Um, and uh, reason also can often get things wrong. What's so great about reason? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I find that objection, which I've also heard a lot, to be in some some way self-refuting because in some way if you're arguing you're arguing against reason but how are you making the argument well if you're making an argument by screaming and shouting and shaking your <laughs> fist then it's not uh, self-refuting at all but if you're making an argument by saying by giving sort of facts and giving data then you're just drawing upon reason reason itself it's not as if there's all these different cues to morality. There's empathy, and there's shame, and there's lust, and then there's reason. And there are all these things together, and we have to choose. Reason is in a different category, because reason is what is what we use to choose. If we're setting up a party, and there's going to be 100 people, and uh, we have, uh, you know, and we have to divide up, figure out how many cookies to buy, and we figure each person wants four cookies. And you have two people, and one person says, okay, I'm gonna go get my calculator and figure out how many cookies to buy. And the other person says, I'm gonna listen to my gut. I'm gonna do it based on my gut. Um, who's better? Well, the person who goes to the calculator. How do you know? Because that's the number that as reflective people will be the right one. Same for morality. So for morality, in, in the end, reason, reason's gonna give you the right answer ultimately. Because even if it gives you the wrong answer at first, the way you'll know it's wrong is by the further application of reason. So you think there are examples where reason might tell us to do something that, for example, push a heavy guy off a bridge to save five people that in our guts we feel is wrong. Now maybe there you think that that really is the right thing to do, but are there examples where reason seems to lead us to um, to do something that we feel is wrong and we can't explain why? 
there's no shortage of, of, of cases where yeah. people use their intelligence and their rationality to come out with something which is monstrous and stupid and evil. Um, the Nazi doctors, many genocidal movements, are people who believe themselves to be cold-bloodedly rational and so on. But I think the way to think of that is not that reason is inadequate, but rather um, that people do it badly. They make mistakes, they build off faulty premises, and so on. And in the end, whenever we look at those cases and say that they're, well, those guys really screwed up, how do we know? I think part answer how we know is because we think about it now and we recognize that their reason was faulty. So in some way, and maybe we disagree on this, but in some way, I can't imagine a case where we think about it really hard and we talk about it and we decide that this is the right thing. But at a gut level, very quickly, this seems like the right thing. And then we would go with this. I think that, that, that that's not coherent. I think in the end, what it means to make a moral decision is to draw upon your reasoned consideration. Yeah, I think that that is counter to a lot of people's sort of, you know, intuitions or, or instincts. Um, so, you know, the people generally sort of uh, don't want to push the fat man off the bridge to save five people though they don't understand why they don't want to and they, they see the parallel in the two types of trolley cases where both times you're sacrificing one life for, for five. But I think a lot of people would stick to the argument that the moral decision there is the one that aligns with what I feel is the right thing to do, not regardless of the math. Um, and I think that's a hard thing, for, thing to sort of overcome um, to, to trust sort of a moral philosophy, a, a, a reasoned way of thinking through moral problems, and not trust that kind of gut feeling. I think that's right. I, th I, I agree that as a psychological fact, it's very hard to override your gut feelings. Um, the trolley case is complicated because you can provide reasons also for not pushing the man. But yeah, I, I have a family member who really thinks that homosexuality is immoral. And, and she says, you know, it's disgusting, they should be put in prison, and so on. And, and I don't have that view, so I would argue with her. And this argument, that argument. And in the end, she would go, like you're saying, and say, well, I don't care about your fancy arguments. I know what's right. And what's right is that what they're doing is immoral. I just think that your psychological observation is true, but as reflective moral beings, I should win in that case. The person, or, or to put it another way, if assume a, a more a more reasoned way, if 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 my, my relative had the gut feeling, but she acknowledged that there's no reason for it, she should not let the gut feeling hold sway. And um, and you're right about the psychology of it is often we go for our gut no matter what. But the reality of it is that our gut feelings often reflect irrational biases and shouldn't really be trusted. I'm very much against listen to your heart. I'm very much against follow your feelings and all that. I think that there are a few problems in life that can't be solved with a good cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll look forward for, to more arguments for that uh, claim in future weeks. Um, I'm going to end with one last question, which comes from Ivy Huang. Um, and she, I, I guess, has uh, been looking at your book, your uh, morality book. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the, sorry the, uh, the title of the course, actually, is Moralities of Everyday Life. Um, and she thinks it's a great title for a book. Um, and he's, she's wondering whether you have a plan to write a book called this. It, it is a wonderful title for a book. Uh, but it's already been used. The, the, the UPenn psychologist John Sabini um, wrote a wonderful book called Moralities of Everyday Life. And, uh, and it was from this book. I actually acknowledged this in my Devane lectures when I present them, was the impetus for me using the title for my MOOC. That doesn't preclude me from using that as a book again, though, and I might, I might just say I'm, I'm borrowing the title from that book. But, uh, but I do love the sound of the title. My next book, by the way, um, might be called Against Empathy, 
but it might also be called Age of Reason, which I kind of like because it sounds like an HBO series. <laughs> so um, if people want to, those of you who have made it to end of office hours want to weigh in on your preferred title for my next book, I'd be grateful. All right. We'll put up a poll up in the yes, discussion forums. Yes. All right. Well, that's all for this week. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.